Hello, you're watching Entertainment Week. Coming up on the show, Bob Geldof brings back Band-Aid, but do charity singles do more harm than good? Jason Manford joins us to talk endless tours and the joys of stand-up. We speak to the director of the Alan Turing biopic, The Imitation Game, and star of the film, Benedict Cumberbatch, pays tribute to the unsung hero of World War II. First, 30 years after the original raised £8 million for famine relief in Africa, Bob Geldof has brought back Band-Aid for a new version of Do They Know It's Christmas. This time round, the likes of One Direction, Ed Sheeran and Chris Martin are uniting to raise money to combat the Ebola outbreak in West Africa. Bob says the UN called him personally to ask for help and he couldn't refuse. Mothers can't touch their children when they're dying. Fathers can't touch their children when they're dying. Lovers can't cradle each other. Wives can't hold their husbands' hands. It is the very antithesis of what it is to be human. So with this record, we reach out and touch them. I'm joined now by entertainment journalist Steve Hargrave and Polly Jones, head of campaigns at the World Development Movement. Steve, Bob Geldof, he's still got it, hasn't he? He can pick up the phone and get an impressive lineup to help out. Yeah, I mean, his context book's nearly as big as his hairstyle at the moment, isn't it? All over the place. He certainly can. I mean, he can sort of call him up and sort of does them. Um, well, we're on the fourth one now, aren't we, and stuff. So everyone kind of wants to get involved, I guess, because we've got that nostalgia thing now for the original Band Aid single is that everyone, when they do it, we all know and love that song and we grew up with it. That when they come and say we want to do another version, and every pop star wants to be on it so that future generations can kind of look back. It's like a time capsule of every given year when they do it, and this is about who's who at the moment. So you get your One Direction, your Ed Sheeran, Chris Martin, Bono will come back, George Michael will come back, Will Adele will come back, possibly, and they're all going to record it, and, and then it'll be uh, on the X Factor in and out on Monday. It's a perfect marketing strategy in terms of getting people to yeah, give... Yeah, they've thought it through, haven't they? They've thought it through very well. <laughs> get it out quick, and uh, everyone give a pound next week. It'll be number one, and presumably, you know, raise millions next week, and then release a physical product. So it's a great marketing strategy, and why not? You know, everyone give that money to a charity as we run up to Christmas again. I guess it works, doesn't it? But, Polly, there have been criticisms, particularly of the original song and um, sort of the image it gave of Africa and what it did to actually the development of the continent. That's that's right. Um, there's even something called the Live Aid Legacy, this whole idea that uh, with the Band-Aid singles and the imagery, imagery that went with it, that Africa was treated like a country, not a continent. It didn't recognise the people who were struggling with the, the famine in Ethiopia in Ebola today as individuals. They were victims that were there to be helped by us in the West. Um, and that's a really uncomfortable message. And it's not been very helpful. The UK public um, has questions about the role that uh, we should play in giving aid. And this kind of imagery and, and lyrics like last time um, really put people off helping in a long-term sustainable way to really tackle the root causes of the problems. Um, the single raised about £8 million. Pounds, the mm. Live Aid concerts raised £150 yeah. million. So an extraordinary amount of money. But do you think that the, uh, the, the disadvantages outweigh the advantages of something like this? There, there, are, there are two problems. One is um, how the money itself will be used. Um, it's it's Band-Aid 30, but you could argue that it's actually just a sticking plaster um, on, and because it doesn't tackle the root, the root issues. What those countries need are, are, are public health systems, and you can't fund those with a lump sum of money that comes when the, when the singles come out. You need that money on a long-term basis so that governments can plan. And the other issue is around, around the messaging, this live aid legacy. Does it really tell us a story about Africa as it is, um, rather than Africa in a kind of victim charity idea that we, um, we, we sometimes believe it is? Uh, Steve, Bob Geldof has said that they are going to update the lyrics. They've been very clear about that. And also, there can be no doubt that people involved in this are doing, think they're doing good. It, I mean, it, it, is, it is always that really that tricky thing, isn't it? And I guess people would say, like, like you said, I mean, would you rather have that lumps of money? What's the other alternative? Is it that people give nothing? I mean, are yeah, you and don't care. Can, you, we, can, you, you, know, can mm. you engage kids who like One Direction to actually care about something and to want to give money or the, or the parents raise to actually the carry on giving things? Thing. So well, is it better to have one big massive hit like this. They have an amazing opportunity to really get some of this messaging right, to tell people something about Africa as it really is. So I look forward to seeing what the lyrics really are. Um, I certainly, that now, I mean, we are worried about the lyrics. To feed the world is, um, yeah, 
is it was not right last time and Africa mm. isn't a continent of the of burning sun without water. Well that's exactly the lyric that's that he said he was gonna clear of going to change. Um, but 1984 I mean was such a stunning success in a lot of ways. Yeah. Do you think they can ever replicate the no, success? Well, well no I, I think they're nonsense and in, in a way it's refreshing to see Bob Geldof go you know what this song might be awful and you yeah. may hate all and the And you don't it doesn't board. matter if I mean, you don't I, like I, it. I, I <laughs> couldn't really turn around and say I'd buy any of the singles that they put out individually but I mean it's good to it's a good excuse to give a pound towards something very easily the system set up to give that 99p perhaps people wouldn't think anyway is the song gonna be any good I don't think so it'd be terrible right everyone will still play the original song but and it doesn't matter there is always that question obviously is to go what is it genuinely about the cause or are yeah. you here for egotistical purposes and I think there's always an argument to be said about which yeah. ones are in which camp on that thank you both so much thank you thank you uh, time now to catch up on the rest of the week's entertainment news there is flash photography coming up D.L. and Pasco actor Warren Clark died aged 67 after a short illness. The Rolling Stones say they're deeply upset after the confidential details of an insurance row became public knowledge. They've now settled the claim over cancelled concerts following the death of Loren Scott. Fleetwood Mac's Christine McVie will rejoin the band for its European tour next year. It's the first time the full lineup have toured for 16 years. The lead singer of the Cranberries, Dolores O'Riordan, was arrested on suspicion of assaulting an air hostess and a police officer after an alleged air rage incident. Rare Andy Warhol portraits of Elvis and Marlon Brando have been sold in a record-breaking auction at Christie's in New York. <laughs> <laughs> and One Direction have been rubbing shoulders with royalty. They met the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge before performing at the Royal Variety Show and Harry was quick to congratulate the mum-to-be. Now, Alan Turing was one of the unsung heroes of World War II, a mathematician who cracked the Nazis' Enigma code. But despite Churchill hailing his work as the single biggest contribution to the Allied victory, he was arrested for being gay and convicted for indecency. Benedict Cumberbatch stars in a film about his life, The Imitation Game. I, I like solving problems, Commander. And Enigma is the most difficult problem in the world. No, Enigma isn't difficult, it's impossible. The Americans, the Russians, the French, the Germans, everyone thinks Enigma is unbreakable. Good. Let me try and we'll know for sure, won't we? And the director of The Imitation Game, Morton Tildum, joins me now. Morton, great to see you. Thank you. It's such an incredible story, such mm. a special film. Alan Turing, it's mind-blowing that one his life happened, all mm. these events, and that it's not more widely known, but it's a gift for a filmmaker. It is. I mean, I, w I was sent this script and I was shocked how little I knew about him, mm. uh, which is why I became obsessed with him. Mm. And I had to know everything. And, you know, why, why is not this man on the front cover of my history book when I was in school? Mm. I mean, his, his, his achievements are so staggering. Mm. He is the forefather of computer science. He literally theorized and invented the computer. Mm -hmm. uh, he is one of the biggest unsung heroes uh, for the, from the war. I mean, he's he saved millions of lives, shortened the war. I mean, his his achievements are so staggering, and the great injustice that happened to him after the war. So, so um, uh, it, I I hope that this movie will spread his legacy and his word, uh, not only here in Britain, but throughout the world. There were so many different messages and so many important messages as a viewer, I felt, mm. not least that we should celebrate difference. Was that important to you to bring out? To me, that is the heart of the movie. I mean, he was such a unique and uh, special man. And he was an outsider. He was like the outsider's outsider. Mm -hmm. And uh, to me, that is what I wanted to say with this movie, is that this is, this is the outsider, the one who dares to think differently, who doesn't, who's not really normal <laughs> in any way. Uh, and uh, I wanted to celebrate that and make a movie about that and how important that is. Uh, Benedict Cumberbatch obviously plays Alan Turing. He is sensational. I mean, getting mm. that role, that casting right, was key. Yes. Presumably. I mean, the first thing I said after reading the script is that Benedict Cumberbatch has to play Alan Turing because it's such a complex, layered character. He's mm. so driven and strong and almost arrogant and so fragile and so awkward. And in the core of it is this little boy who has lost so much. Mm. And I think. Benedict is able to portray that so beautifully. 
Um, there's been lots of awards uh, chat. It's very early. I know you're all playing it down, but you've now got the Weinstein machine behind you. That's an incredibly good sign. Um, how are you feeling about the months ahead and the, the, the sort of the Oscar onslaught? Are you ready? Um, <laughs> as ready as can be. I mean, I mean, it, it, it's a great honor. It's a great compliment that people are thinking about this as a, an award movie. And um, I mean, the main thing is that it gets attention and more people will see the movie and more people will know about Alan Turing. I mean, that's, the, uh, that's why I'm glad this is happening. It seems um, it's quite rare to meet um, a cast and um, all the people behind a film who are so passionate mm. and have taken a film and a story really into their hearts. This seems to be what's happened on this film. It was just amazing. As a filmmaker, it, it was such a unique experience because it became a labor of love, a passion project for everybody. Everybody I ask say yes to come aboard. I got all my favorite actors. Uh, everybody, I, my, my favorite production designer, uh, Alexander Splat, my favorite composer, um, editor, everybody who could do huge, big studio movies uh, said yes to come on board. Because it's actually a small movie. I mean, people now think about it as a big movie because it's getting a lot of attention. But it actually is a small, independent movie about, you know, somebody, Alan Turing, which very few people knew about. And all this phenomenal talent wanted to come on board because everybody felt it was important to tell this story and everybody wanted to get it right. Mm. So, and, and there, was like, there was no drama, everybody did, just worked really hard and became this family who wanted to, to spread this legacy of this phenomenal man. It sounds like a dream and I absolutely love the film, so thank you oh, so much. Thank you so much. Jason Manford may be one of the superstars of British stand-up, but just like the rest of us, he's still plagued by the mundane, everyday problems of modern life. So much so that his latest tour is all about what are commonly referred to as first world problems. You get home, and maybe you make you like, should go for a drink? You're like, oh, I don't really want to, but you do, and then suddenly it's half one. You think, how's this happened? <laughs> you got to be up at six, you think, why have I done this? You go upstairs with your heavy legs and your heavier eyes and you open your bedroom door and you turn the light on. And only then do you realise and remember you stripped the bed that morning, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> and Jason joins me now. Jason, great to see Hi, you. Hi, Lucy. You so, right. first world problems, where did this idea come from then? Well, I guess I'd seen it online like everyone else, you know, hashtag first world problems and um, it seemed a lot of people just moaning about tiny things that you shouldn't be moaning about and uh, and something that just made me laugh my brother did one that really made me laugh he said he was eating his dinner and then just halfway through he just suddenly looked really disappointed and i said i said what sort of you he said i, I was just uh, i was just saving the best bit of my dinner till the end and now i'm too full to eat it <laughs> like, that was his point. and off the back of that i just thought there's something in this you know and uh, and so what we ended up doing was um so I wrote the show around it. I mean, it's not all that, of course. That's a sort of 20-minute section in the in the, the full sort of 80 minutes. But uh, it sort of just grew and grew, and, and the audience started to join in with their own. And, um, yeah, it was, it was really good fun. So what are your biggest gripes, then? Um, oh, I've got so many, <laughs> to be honest. I've got so many. You don't There's, want to sound like a grumpy old man, though, I know, do that's you? the problem, isn't it? That's, that's, that's the major problem. Um, I think... Um, at the moment, it's uh, it's crisps. It's it's when your um, it's when your hands are t so greasy from the first bag of crisps that you can't actually open the second bag of crisps. That's my. <laughs> That seems to be one that's bothering me a lot at the moment. It's quite specific to me, I think. You were on tour with this show for quite a while. Yeah. How much does it change over the course of... Oh, loads, loads. I mean, I think we did 280 dates or something no, like that. 280? Yeah. yeah, it was a bit ridiculous. Wow. They just kept adding them. And, uh, so, yeah, How did you it... survive for that long on tour? I don't know, really. I think, I mean, just the, the audiences are great. You know, I mean, 300,000 people, I think, something like that, saw the show. So... They're different each night. And they just join in and say mad things that you would never write. That's, that's what's great about it. It's not like a play, a theatre piece, where it's identical every night. It's, it's, it changes. So I remember one night I was in Skegness. And uh, I'm not showing off. I get to some nice places, Liz. <laughs> and uh, I was talking about my, um, my twin daughters. And uh, I said, oh, has anyone else got twins? And a woman went, yeah, I have. I said, oh, lovely. How old are they? She went five and six. I was like... How's that happened? Like, what's like, what? a miracle? My conversation, yeah. So, so what I like is that sort of interaction. You know, when they when they join in and they say things that uh, you could never get make them. up. Absolutely, you could never write it. You know. So you're doing a lot of telly as well and yeah. theatre, but stand up. I mean, you get such instant gratification from stand up, don't you? Do you enjoy that the most? That's the that's the thing I find the hardest when you end up doing telly is um, what's very different from the stand up is. 
somebody not telling you you're brilliant every eight seconds. <laughs> Because that's essentially what stand-up is. You're like, here's a joke, joke, here's a joke, laugh, here's a joke, laugh. And, uh, yeah, suddenly I've got to wait, like, till it comes out. I'm like, I can't wait Generally for in life, that must be difficult yeah, if that's hard. what you're used to. What I could just do with is someone just follow me around every eight seconds going, you're brilliant. <laughs> That'd be nice. But, I mean, I think everybody could do with that. Yeah, definitely, fair. definitely. <laughs> um, now, this week, um, Stephen Sutton's mum has been given a posthumous... Um, MBE on yeah. behalf of Stephen. Yeah. You were really close friends with him. What an amazing young man. Lovely. I mean, it's such a... I saw uh, Jane Sutton on uh, Sunday night. She had a, a show in Litchfield, and, uh, which, was, uh, which was where Stephen's um, funeral was, of course. And uh, she, I mean, she was bursting with pride and emotion. It's, it, it, it's lovely, of course. You, you know, you can never uh, replace the, the loss of a child, of course. But I think having... That sort of support from uh, from from the country and 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 obviously being that then in turn being shown uh, with gratitude via uh, an award like that has just been a really special mm -hmm. moment for her and um, and they're just a you know they're a wonderful wonderful families have wonderful children you know and I think that's mm -hmm. it's a testament to her as well as it is to him so it was, it, yeah I was really I was really made up for, for for him and and also you know we got to five million pounds this year. Yeah. Uh, for the Teenage Cancer Trust, which means Stephen will be helping uh, children and teenagers with cancer long after, uh, long after this year. You know, and it's, it's that, that's a real testament to them all. Uh, finally, I've got to ask you: the yeah. downside of fame is the unwanted attention. Yeah, I mean, how, yeah. how do you cope with that? I, don't, I mean, I don't mind it really. It doesn't really bother me so much. I've got the family and uh, and and the kids. I'm so busy with kids. Um, <laughs> Three, you've got. I've got four. I've got four, four. children. Yeah, so. <laughs> And the ti the tiring, you know, the tiring. And also, what's great about them is they just every so often they do something that you just think that it's such a magical moment. You know, we we were in the park the other day, me and my daughter, and um, there was a an older girl, sort of about fifteen, trying to get on this swing, and one of the kids swing, you know, where you put your feet through, not the normal one. And I said to my daughter, I said, do you want me to ask this girl to get off? And she said, no, daddy. I'd like to see what happens. And I thought, that's exactly what I was thinking. I'd like to see what happens as well. She's, like, she's assessed it. She's seen this big girl trying to get on the tiny swing and thought, we might get to see a fire engineer. Like, it, it was quite a special moment, you know. <laughs> so I'm so, you know, I'm so engrossed in, in, in fatherhood. Yeah, I just, uh, that's what, I don't really have a day off anymore. Never a dull moment, Jason. Never. Thank you so, so Thanks, much. Lucy. Thank you. Time now to see what's on at the cinema this weekend, including one of the late James Gandolfini's last roles, The Drop. Well, I'm not the guy that wasted his entire life waiting for it to start. Why did that? Mm-hmm. At least I had something once. I was respected. I was feared. When I walked into a place people sat up, they, they sat up straight. They noticed. What'd you ever have? And then Joe joins me now. Joe, so this was actually his last his role. His last ever, and he's back in familiar territory, isn't he? Sort of, he's sort of like a browbeaten Tony Soprano here in the leather jacket and the tracksuits. Um, it's, it's a sort of very familiar film, though, as well. It's the Brooklyn of movies, you know, the sort of run-down dive bars and the stubble and the handguns and the black bin bags and all this kind of stuff. I mean, because of that, it feels slightly formulaic to me, but Tom Hardy and, and uh, James Gandolfini sizzle when they're on uh, screen together. Hardy... Uh, he's film's most convincing hard man, isn't he? I'm terrified. <laughs> yeah, they're a good duo, aren't they? Yeah, and he, he nails the Brooklyn accent as well. I mean, it's got quite a good twist at the end of it, which kind of separates it from sort of maybe a good TV movie. It's, it's made by the same people as The Wire. Um, it, it just feels too familiar, but the Americans make these sort of movies so well, don't they? They're sort of crime uh, dramas set in sort of blue-collar neighbourhoods, and it's worth a watch, and it's a fitting finale for Gandolfini. I think he's better in Enough Said, which was released a couple of months ago on the big screen, but he's great at this, and it's a fitting sort of way for him to bow out, I think. Um, earlier we spoke to the director of The Imitation Game. We've got to talk about it now. What did yeah. you think? I mean, I thought it was absolutely brilliant. Um, well, I mean, I, I like the opening line even. Are you paying attention, as Benedict Cumberbatch says? And you swiftly realise you can't not pay attention. It's that good. It's He's this... absolutely stunning in it as it's well, so, isn't do, it? Do you know the greatest compliment I can give Benedict Cumberbatch in this? Is I completely forget it's him playing yeah, Alan Turing. Yeah. So he just transforms into this character. When you think about how ubiquitous he's been in the yeah. last couple of years, sort of card in Star Trek and small... Sherlock. Morgan, the Hobbit, and 
Sherlock is such a similar character mm. in many respects, but he plays it so differently. You kind of think that he could have played it as like a Sherlock uh, ripoff in many yeah. respects, but he's this like nuanced, multi layered character mm. where the ticks and stammers and mm. a genius and he alienates friend and foe. I can't recommend it highly enough. I mean, yeah. it obviously I'm won, with you, definitely. It, it won the Toronto. The, Film Festival Prize, mm. isn't it? It's going to be showered with with awards yeah, and nominations. Yeah, it's been Oscars and everything, isn't but it? But he should win the Oscar. Yeah. I was trying to think who's better, Timothy Spall or no, definitely, um, or yeah, he's definitely, definitely but he's got so good in this. He's fantastic. I spoke to him um, a couple of weeks ago and was talking to him about Alan Turing because he's incredibly passionate about this film and about the man himself. While it is really important that ultimately this 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 stands as a legacy that we really appreciate what what happened to the end of his life which was a true tragedy um and a dark stain of shame i think on our um history and uh, culture of that time it is also a celebration of a unique mind who was a hero a very quiet stoic different and um uncompromising hero, really. It must be very gratifying in some ways as an actor to feel like you're doing something so important. There are so many different messages, there are so yeah. many different levels to this film, yeah. apart from the fact that you're telling the story of Alan Turing, you're talking yeah. about difference and discrimination, and it's, so for an actor, very interesting and, and gratifying. I, I, absolutely, I think, you know, these, these, like I said about the other men and women at Bletchley Park, these were quiet heroes, stoic, but quite untold stories to, to a large extent, and even now people don't speak about it, even though it's after the, the, the gestation of the Official Secrets Act. So I think to celebrate that on a broader spectrum and to have a larger audience sort of made more aware, which, you know, shamefully, this man should be on the back of one of our notes. He really should. My favourite film of the year, absolutely no question. I'm going to go and see it again at least once. It's what definitely about you? up there. It's definitely up there. Yeah, and, and also it's criminally undertold, isn't it? That the story of Alan Turing, and it's important, I think, for people to go and uh, and recognise this British hero. He should be on the back of banknotes, as Cumberbatch said there. Definitely a film that I don't think is going to be as popular with you. Nativity Three. Oh my <laughs> God, uh, the, you haven't done the the little bit after it. Dude, where's my donkey? I mean, the worst ever film title, I think. <laughs> Dude, where's the exit? I think <laughs> you'll be frying out after two minutes. It's this sort of plotless mess where they find. And, you know, if you get kicked in the head by a donkey, it's hilarious. Donkey poo is hilarious too as well. It's got flash mobs that they think are uh, really funny. I think they were last funny in 2005. It's got sing-alongs that make the X Factor um, sing-along on a Sunday night look like Band-Aid 30. It's what, dreadful. What kids like it, though? Um, I think even the naughtiest kid at Christmas shouldn't be sort of put through this, <laughs> this film. I mean, it's silly even by silly season standards. Avoid, okay. go watch Paint Dry, do not watch it, do not pass your money over for this movie. It's terrible. How they made three of them, I have no idea. Uh, one for the adults, then, very much for the yes. adults. Uh, Fifty Shades of Grey, the trailer is out. Now, I've read, I shouldn't admit this, all the books for, um, obviously, for research purposes yeah, only. Course. So I'm interested to see this. What did you think of the trailer? Well, I made the mistake of watching it in an open plan office outside, which was a terrible <laughs> idea. And the week I've also been looking at Kim Kardashian on the front page of Paper <laughs> Magazine. It's just been a bad week for me. But, uh, yeah, very steamy. Uh, it looks like there's no holds barred with this. I haven't read the books. It's one of those films that's released on Valentine's Day next year. It's one of those uncomfortable films, I think, or, to watch Don't go public. on a first date. Don't go on a first date and keep your Jamie hands where Dornan, you can see them. Though, is, yes. He's hot property, isn't it? Yeah, he's in the, the fall at the moment. Gillian mm. Anderson said she can't look at him now without imagining him without his clothes on. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, he's going to be, be thrilling everyone, I'm sure, next uh, Valentine's Day. Yeah, definitely one to look forward to, Joe. Thank you so much. And that is all for now. On next week's show, the queen of crime novels, Patricia Cornwell, joins us in the studio. British rap star Wretch32 gets in touch with his sensitive side on his latest single. And can the penultimate Hunger Games movie live up to the hype? We give our verdicts.